This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 24. Welcome to the 24th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I love hearing from you so if you enjoy today's show please stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes. You'll find the show notes for today's episode and all the podcast episodes at fertilityfriday.com slash podcast. You can find me on the Fertility Friday Facebook page at facebook.com slash Fertility Fridays. And of course, you can find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. And I'm very excited to welcome today's guest, Jane Bennett, to the show. Jane originally trained in social work and clinical hypnotherapy and is now working as a researcher, counselor, and educator. Jane's main area of focus has been educating women and girls about nat- natural fertility management methods. Jane designed and wrote a program called the Natural Fertility Management Conception Kit and the Natural Fertility Management Contraception Kit, offering in-depth knowledge and teachings of the fertility awareness method for contraception and optimal conception that is both easy to learn and easy to use. And during her time working with natural fertility management, Jane became aware of the need for a more positive and healthy attitude towards menstruation for the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of women and girls. She is the author of The Pill, Are You Sure It's For You?, and A Blessing, Not a Curse, which is a mother-daughter guidebook about menarche, menstruation, and the menstrual cycle. And she also runs an amazing program, Celebration Day for Girls, and it's for teenage girls as a rite of passage to help celebrate their entrance into womanhood around the time that they're getting their first periods. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Jane. Thank you, Lisa. It's really great to be here with you. Oh, I'm so happy to have you today. And so although I did give you a bit of an introduction, I would love to hear just a little bit about um, kind of your own journey and how you found, found yourself doing this work and I guess what, uh, what caused you to stay in it and basically devote your, it's, it's basically your life's work. Yes, it, it certainly has become my life's work. Uh, not that I originally planned it that way, but uh, life often happens like that. For me, uh, the the big shift happened when I was 26 and started to learn the natural fertility management methods of, of fertility awareness uh, with Francesca Nash. And she... Uh, she had been putting these methods together originally in 1975 really to answer her own contraception needs when she really wasn't wanting to go down the road of uh, synthetic hormones and, and so the other very sort of invasive techniques. And I met her in the early 80s and uh, we were working together at a, at a natural health clinic and I heard about her methods. And, and I thought, you know, this was really new to me and I, I had had a, you know, probably a pretty standard uh, experience of contraception. I had been on the pill. Uh, I had tried an IUD uh, and I eventually found a diaphragm, and, which I was using at the time and really was much happier with that than the other two. Uh, but still, I heard about Francesca and her methods and I thought, wow, that's really great. You know, uh, I think that's really terrific. However, even despite... Um, having that response, it took me two years to actually knock on her door and, and make an appointment and, and come to see her. And I, in retrospect, I think the reason it took me that time is because uh, while I thought the idea of this was great, nothing in my life up to that point had given me any reason to feel that I could um, understand my body well enough have a sense of when I was fertile and when I wasn't fertile well enough to trust that for the purpose of contraception. And it actually took a new boyfriend who was also really keen on these methods to uh, want to do this with me and that really gave me the confidence and the support to actually go ahead and uh, and learn these methods. Uh, once I did, we, we you know, and you're, you're familiar yourself with the, the, the process of uh, learning fertility awareness. So once mm-hmm. I had seen Francesca and went home and began charting uh, and within the first sort of month or two, really starting to see on the page from my daily observations really starting to see where I was in my cycle what was happening how easy it was actually to read these symptoms at this time it was like an epiphany for me and I felt why 
why wasn't I given this information earlier? Um, it's just so great being able to understand where I am in my cycle, why I might be feeling different things sort of emotionally and physically during the cycle. And I felt that it was incredibly empowering. And from that time, really was very keen to share this with other girls and women. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think it's safe to say that women who have the good fortune and opportunity to learn the fertility awareness method share that sentiment. It's such a common sentiment. First of all, why didn't I learn it? And also wanting to share it, you know, with as many women as possible. And so given your experience through the years and your, your clinical practice, you know, how important do you think it is for women to actually have the opportunity to learn how their body works and to learn natural fertility management methods? Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's, I think it's incredibly important. I would like to see it to be uh, considered as a, as a fundamental life skill for women and girls whether they're wanting to use it for contraception or conception or not, although it's incredibly handy for that, for that uh, to really understand when we're fertile and when we're not. Even beyond that, I think it's an incredible skill and incredible awareness to have to understand our cycles, to understand where we're, where we're at in our cycles, uh, and to really be able to use that as a, uh, a menstrual well-being process as well so that we then can understand how we need to support ourselves if we're having any uncomfortable symptoms uh, physically or emotionally with our, with our cycles. I, I think it's fundamental to understanding ourselves as women and to uh, practicing self-care as women. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was reading your book, um, The Pill, Are You Sure It's For You?, um, which is an amazing book, by the way. I absolutely Thank loved you. it. Um, but one of the, I guess, one of the topics that really kind of shine through your book is that <laughs> menstruation has a point and that it's there for a reason. And that um, because it, as, as, as you know, as, as a lot of the listeners who've kind of tuned in over the different episodes that I've recorded know, I mean, the media and our kind of current culture is trying to push this idea that menstruation is just doesn't have a purpose. And unless you're trying to have a baby, it's not necessary. And one of the things I found really interesting in your book was how you talked about even just the, the, the purpose of having body rhythms and the seasonal kind of, I guess, the way that our bodies operate cyclically and why that's important. And I thought maybe you, you could talk a little bit about menstruation and, and why it is actually important. I feel like that's an important first step in trying to kind of give women the opportunity to try natural methods to actually feel that their menstruation is important. <laughs> Oh, absolutely, and and I think uh, you know there's a, there's a number of different sides to to this, and the first one I will uh, speak to is if we think about it, for the average uh, woman in a Western country, uh, if we're having you know one point something or up to two children on average, of course some women have more, um, that means that 99.5 percent of our if we if we were to go through our um, fertile life and have natural cycles that would mean that 99.5 percent of our cycles uh, end in menstruation rather than in conception pregnancy and birth uh, so to consider that 99.5 percent of this uh, incredibly fundamental feminine, uh, female natural cycle that we have is is useless really I think hits at the heart of what it is to be uh, to be female uh, to be human with a female body uh, and I think I think this really plays in if we have this uh, the the, the um, perhaps the the most common uh, understanding of menstruation as you said is that you know in a way that it's not in inverted commas not natural or that it's meaningless is really striking at the core of who we are as women to to say that that this very fundamental aspect of being a woman uh, in a woman's body means nothing. Uh, I also think it's uh, by by spending some time to gently observe, to look into really in the same way as we might, uh, some people might, uh, if they're practicing yoga, just uh, practicing breath awareness. In a similar way, if we practice menstrual cycle awareness, 
it can really open up a lot of deep understanding about ourselves, who we are, how we're responding to life. And through the uh, understanding we will have our, our own cyclical nature, we can uh, see ourselves and observe ourselves and experience ourselves in all these different stages of the cycle, which really has a capacity to deepen our self-awareness uh, in a very profound way. So I, I think the purpose of menstruation is clearly on a, on a purely uh, biological level is to do with reproduction. And we have this whole other side to it as well. That is, many women today are really exploring um, the emotional, physical, psychological, spiritual aspects of a natural menstrual cycle. Uh, and the women who are exploring that are finding great rich depths within themselves as they, as they do that. And uh, perhaps another way of looking at that is uh, we have, if we think of uh, different parts of our body, you know, that have a, have a physical function like our heart or our eyes or our ears, we also commonly, culturally, have uh, talk about uh, the metaphor of the heart, the metaphor of seeing, the metaphor of hearing, the metaphor of being handy, using our hands. Uh, mm -hmm. And similarly, I would like to say that our, our menstrual cycle and the processes of our reproductive organs, yes, they have a very important function in reproducing our species, but there's also a metaphor. And, you know, listeners may like to think about what that is for them. I would propose that it's to do with creativity on a very profound level level it doesn't mean that women who don't have a menstrual cycle or or even a, a womb aren't uh, creative nonetheless the menstrual cycle itself can be for many women who are observing it uh, a, a very strong um, cycle of creativity for them mm -hmm. I think it's important for at least for women to have the opportunity to learn that menstruation is a positive part of life and also that it is part of of life because um in the book i know you talked about the kind of slow implementation of you know first there was the pill the you know the 28 days and then there was seasonal 84 days and then there was the i forget the new uh pill that's 365 days and it's just kind of edging towards the point of, you know, women can choose to menstruate and we can obviously, but you can choose uh, and basically as if it serves no purpose. So I really just, uh, I really appreciated your, the perspective that you shared in the book about the purpose of menstruation and why it's important and how it can actually, how becoming in touch with that aspect of our lives can really improve everything really. Mm, absolutely. And, and there, there is research underway and some results are starting to come in that can show us even uh, physiologically and, and health wise the importance of this regular rhythm of uh, of the, the, the significant variations in hormones on, uh, in, in the different days of the cycle and how this uh, keeps us healthy in, uh, in particular ways, certainly for these years that we have a menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, and a large part of your work is not only working with women to teach women how to understand and uh, chart their cycles for both, you know, pregnancy and also for contraception, but also working with young women and to, to create that positive association with their menstrual cycles right from menarche. And maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of menarche and I guess the process of how our bodies mature and um, because it, that's not really talked about a lot about how it takes a little bit of time for a, women, a woman's cycle to mature and why it's important for menarche to actually be acknowledged and, and celebrated. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I actually uh, run two programs. One is called A Celebration Day for Girls and this is a program for uh, 10 to 12 year old girls uh, part of it's on their own with me um, or the other facilitators that I've trained and part of it is with the girls and the mothers together and I have another program for girls in their mid-teens up to about 17 uh, called cool on the inside 
Mm-hmm. And both of these different programs are, are really highlighting uh, uh, and, and, and teaching positive menstrual education. But obviously for the different age groups, it's, you know, it's from a very different perspective. With schools that are 10 to 12 year old uh, 10 to 12 years old or, or around about those ages um, mostly the girls that come to the workshop haven't started uh, their period although of course there are some who may have very recently started that come along and uh, my purpose in that is to really tease out and talk about and do really fun activities around uh, the, the nature of cycles, the menstrual cycle, the physiological processes, the practicalities uh, in terms of pads um, and, and other ways of uh, catching menstrual blood, um, looking at different cultures, what they have, well, how they have managed their blood, how they have celebrated uh, menarch uh, and menstruation, um, talking, uh, you know, sharing women's stories. There's many, many different angles that we come from. That uh, to me, really, what I, what uh, we try to do is is to really give a perspective of how important this is in our lives, rather than what is common. I'm not sure about Canada, but certainly in Australia and many countries where menstruation, uh, as far as it is taught in schools, it tends to be just tagged on to um, just a general sex ed or reproductive education, where um, <clears throat> there's a conversation about uh, you know about ovulation and fertilization of the egg and pregnancy and conception and so on if there's not a conception then this is what this is what happens and, and a conversation about menstruation and perhaps some sort of conversation about pads and tampons and and how to use them and menstrual uh, hygiene as they mm-hmm. as they say um i I have a sort of a, I hope not too derogatory, but slightly derogatory term for that and i call it i call it the plumbing approach <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, because it's really just about the plumbing. Whereas uh, for us, the given that we, you know, we're spending thirty-five to forty uh, years of our lives um, for those of us who are uh, menstruating and, and experiencing a natural menstrual cycle, we're spending decades of our lives somewhere in our menstrual cycle. Mm-hmm. And maybe occasionally pregnant and having a post postnatal amenorrhea where we have some months where we don't have a period. So um, it is a really significant part of our lives, and yet uh, we receive so little information and so little uh, education around it, and so little conversation uh, with other women. There's so little policy at schools, at workplaces. Um, you know, we're, 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 these days we often have, um, you know, significant policies around uh, making a workplace suitable for people in all different situations uh, and similarly schools uh, and yet very little. I mean, there may be, there may be some um, <clears throat> commonly, uh, excuse me, commonly there are, um, there's, you know, maybe sort of some bins are provided in toilets, but very little else that really supports um, girls especially as they are making this incredible transition in their lives. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Um, I like the way you coined it, the plumbing approach, because I, the way I look at it, I feel like it's just so that no one ends up bleeding in school. Like we have to just make sure to sop up the blood and then everything else is irrelevant. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a very kind of reductionist approach and people are not comfortable talking about it. They often separate the boys and the girls. So the girls get the pad talk and then the boys get to do whatever it is that they do while the girls are having the pad talk. And obviously it's not, en- it's not enough. And one of the ideas that I really just love about, about the work that you do, especially with teenage girls, is about having that rite of passage. And maybe you could talk a little bit about why it's actually important to have a rite of passage and why, I mean, traditional cultures have lots of different, you know, rite of passage ceremonies where you kind of move from girl to woman or boy to man and why it's actually important to have something to acknowledge that you're kind of transitioning into adulthood. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it is a very important rite of passage. And, and I think um, I'm going to answer your question initially by by sort of the negative of it. <laughs> and that is that I think in, uh, and it's certainly true here in Australia, and I would, I would expect it's probably true where you, where you are too, Lisa, is that 
Um, I think one of the reasons why we don't, as a society, sort of emphasise this time in a girl's life very much is because of a, a fear of if we talk about it too much or if we emphasise the positive of it, it's going to encourage girls to get pregnant. Um, now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and it doesn't, it doesn't bear up with research either. But we, because we're at a time in history where we have a really significant gap between when girls start to uh, have their periods uh, to when they're wanting to conceive, there's often, you know, there may be, you know, two or three, sometimes three decades uh, between those times. So we're not in a society now where soon after a girl may start to uh, have a regular cycle, maybe in her sort of mid to late teens, that culturally it's, it's fine to start having children. Mm -hmm. So we've separate, you know, and that's that's the nature of history. I'm not suggesting we go back to that. But um, I, I do think what we need to look at is this is happening for girls. It is an important change. It's an important, uh, not only physical, but emotional and psychological and where there is awareness of it, spiritual change as well. Um, and it's important to emphasise this is uh, a factor of a girl's life you know, apart from whether she's uh, in a relationship, apart from whether she's uh, looking to conceive, you know, it's really quite separate. It's something that's uh, worthy of her paying attention to in and of itself. It's not connected to relationship. Um, and it's as I found, as I'm sure you found, and so many women who learn fertility awareness later on, um, it's so empowering to have an understanding and a positive appreciation of your body and, and an understanding of, of hormones and how they might be uh, affecting you at different times. And it empowers you then to uh, perhaps uh, work with a different different um, either lifestyle or health practices in either to in, in order to make that as positive as possible. In so many ways, this helps us. In so many ways, it also helps us as girls, you know, once, uh, once girls do start to, you know, have a regular cycle, to understand that it's they might naturally have fluctuations, uh, even if they're within, you know, they're not having particularly difficult periods or pain or or these kind of experiences. That it's quite natural to have times in the cycle where they may be really bursting with energy and bursting with creativity, and other t and and bursting with, uh, you know, um, uh, extroversion, and other times in their cycle where they may have less energy they may be feeling more introspective they may want to have more time to themselves and that one isn't better than the other but by understanding uh these these uh, differences for themselves they can uh accept those differences and work with them in a really positive way it doesn't doesn't mean you get to choose every day you know uh you, you might have certain commitments but it does mean you can vary the speed at which you're you're going through your day or you may there may be some uh variables that you can change a little, little bit uh so rather than making one part of the month you know oh i feel like this so that's really acceptable and that's great and i feel good about myself and another part of the month where oh i don't feel like that so so much i don't feel so social uh there's something wrong with me i'm a bad person you know we can really head off a lot of uh, emotional uh, distress by giving by helping girls have this understanding not that there's one template you know the importance is observing ourselves and understanding our own rhythms with the cycle uh, rather than I mean there, there are there are some common uh, common common observances that girls and women have but nonetheless the the key thing is that we observe ourselves and understand our own changes and what's going to most support us mm -hmm. I think that that is uh, so empowering I think it's one of the kind of empowering side effects that happens when you chart fertility awareness uh, or when you you know start using fertility awareness or when you chart your cycles it might not even be intentional but just the act of recording uh, your cycles and your moods you kind of start to just be more aware because you see that there's a pattern and now you can understand yourself better. So naturally, there's going to be periods of the t of your cycle where you're more introspective or when you're more outgoing or when you're more creative or when you have more energy and it all starts to make more sense 
when you understand that it's part of kind of your body's rhythm. And, and I think that's just so powerful. And one of the questions that kind of I was thinking of as you were, as you were, um, as you were talking about working with teenage girls is kind of the question of what are your thoughts on teaching teenage girls fertility awareness? I mean, I think that it's a, I think that it's a great idea. And I think that it's important, as you said at the very beginning, which is that whether women choose to use this method for contraception or for trying to get pregnant, regardless, you know, all women should have the opportunity to learn it. Um, so what are your thoughts on actually teaching this information to young women? Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's such a health positive uh understanding of ourselves and understanding of our bodies that then helps set girls up for the next several decades and, and ways of understanding themselves um, and and their fertility, but also the, the, the rhythms of their, as we've talked about, of their um, energy, of their health, of their, you know, their, their extroversion, introversion, so many, so many layers are, uh, and it really gives girls a, an insight and young women an insight into themselves in this way. I would see, um, I'm very passionate about teaching girls, um, maybe in their, mid-teens mid to late teens depending you know how long they've been cycling for um it uh in my perfect world all girls would have have done some uh uh fertility awareness um charting um and education before they leave school mm -hmm. uh, i think it's a it's a really essential life skill it's not uh you know, in a way, it's not rocket science. You know, it really is a process of spending time, having appropriate charts, um, uh, good, clear teaching, and spending that time and being given the understanding that it's valuable to spend the time, which doesn't take much, as, as you're aware, to do some charting every day, to check uh, cervical mucus, to check the temperature uh, over a period of a few months, uh, just to get the hang of how this works. Then from that, there are a whole lot of choices. Uh, girls, uh, at whatever time they're looking toward uh, needing contraception, they can then choose to go ahead and and learn the, the 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 rules and patterns around that for fertility awareness in order to use that as an optimum contraception method at such a time later on that they're they may be wanting to conceive they already have a close understanding of their fertility and they can just brush up on those methods in order to be to be uh attempt conception at the right time and the healthiest time um and as I said, apart from that, it gives them a, a self-awareness that helps with um, their, their health practices. And I'll give you a really, maybe an extreme example of this, but it's a very powerful example. Uh, a, a woman I know who has worked with fertility awareness methods for, for many years and taught them and, and counseled women and couples, she became aware that her mucus in her second half of her cycle was really different over a couple of months it was it was quite uh different to what she had um experienced for you know quite a, a lot of years before that she was very familiar with her own uh her own uh cervical mucus so she she after a couple of months of this she thought this was worthy of checking out uh she went to a doctor um and she was uh she went and she went on to um uh, several doctors and was checked out and it was found that she had a uh uh the early stages of what is usually a lethal high cervical cancer wow. and uh so she went on because of you know it was very unusual for women that had this particular cancer to survive it uh because it's usually generally asymptomatic people don't notice things until it's quite advanced and so she went uh, on to have treatment for this which went on for a, a year or so uh, you know quite invasive treatment but still she's she's alive and well to talk about it today and she uh a number of times during that year, 
she was uh, she was approached by oncologists to to who wanted to ask her how did she know how did she know to get this checked out because she was in a way the poster girl for this uh, to, for survival of this particular cancer and so she would start to talk to them about um, you know about the changes she was seeing in her cervical mucus and she would say really into about the second sentence of her explanation they were without a without an exception they would glaze over mm -hmm. uh, they they really could not in their training and understanding they couldn't compute that a woman could know the changes in her their, in her cervical mucus well enough to detect this uh, and to be clear enough about that to instigate uh, a um, an investigation of what was different so you know, in this, this is, as I said, it's an extreme example, but it does, is, is a very powerful illustration of how knowing our bodies in this way can be uh, an incredible tool for our well-being. Um, it isn't the, uh, it isn't the general understanding of uh, medical practitioners at this time that we, that women can know themselves this well, but uh, for women who have practiced fertility awareness, have done some charting, have, uh, have observed their cycles over time. Um, if you speak to those women, as you are and as I am, uh, we, we're very aware of how much we understand about our bodies and the changes that are happening and when things in our cycle are off uh, health-wise or when we're feeling, you know, really... Uh, you're really in good hormonal uh, balance and hormonal health, and uh, it's it's it really is an incredible self care awareness. Um, and what women then do with that, with they might have their own particular uh, lifestyle, health, dietary practices that they will then. Um, uh, up the temperature on, let's say, if if they feel that they've had a, a sort of a, a particularly rough cycle. I mean, a lot of women might, oh, okay, I've got to, I've got to really, um, you know, not have any junk food and tighten up my sort of uh, my dietary practices for the next month, or I need to have more rest, or uh, or you know, on a number of fronts, I need fronts, I need to, um, you know, practice more self awareness. So the uh, and health practices so the awareness of the menstrual cycle can actually it's like a a health meter mm -hmm. so we're if we look at it in a particular way we can see that the women who have and i completely acknowledge women who have very difficult periods or very difficult times premenstrually um, and that it's hard it may be hard if you're one of those women to uh, to see that there's a positive in menstruation what I would invite you if, you, if you're that kind of, if you're a woman who has that experience, what I would invite you to have a, a, a think about is that perhaps the menstrual cycle and particularly menstruation and the premenstruum uh, is actually just alerting you to, uh, to health imbalances or health issues that might be there in an ongoing and underlying uh, state in your body uh, and that uh, the premenstruum and, and menstrual time is really just exacerbating and showing you where those issues are. For me, I like to separate uh, menstruation itself, the menstrual cycle and menstrual problems. Uh, these aren't the same thing. Hmm. They're, two, they're two very different things. Menstrual problems are a sign of health issues which can be treated sometimes very simply and easily. Sometimes it's more difficult and protracted, but they are indicative of a health issue, not a problem with menstruation itself. Does that make sense? I absolutely love that. I think that making that distinction is so important and I've never heard it put exactly in that way. And I just absolutely love that because it's just like you said, menstruation itself um, I mean, I did um, an episode with Colleen Flowers and we went through the topic of the day was uh, um, it was menstruation as the fifth vital sign. And so she really gave a detailed explanation of what kind of falls in the category of normal and healthy for menstruation. So kind of the parameters. And so one of the things she talked about is that in a healthy menstrual cycle, you shouldn't really have any pain. You shouldn't have excessive bleeding. And she defined what excessive bleeding is but uh, a lot of women I feel I feel most women have never really been provided with parameters of a healthy cycle so 
they're like you like you said and like you suggested you know menstruation is just coupled in with all these problems as if menstruation is the problem but menstruation itself is not a problem and menstrual issues should absolutely be separated out from that mm. Absolutely. I, I really like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to now, uh, I hadn't heard of Colleen Flowers. I, is she uh, from Canada or? Uh... She lives in the, the United States and she is one of the, uh, she's a Justice HRHP uh, practitioner. So she was trained uh, through Justice HealthWorks through Geraldine Mathis. Mm. And, uh, and so, I mean, she, she basically teaches fertility awareness, but one of the seminars that she has done and some of the work that she's done is specifically kind of in that area of raising awareness of of the importance of I mean I think all Justice HRHPs are trained in that same vein where you you know part of the training is to understand how your menstrual cycle is indicative and will be like you said a health meter and so problems in your health show up in your charts. Great, thank you. I'm I'm going to. Uh, I, I really liked what you said, uh, and I, I will follow that up with her. You know, the the uh, talk call, calling menstruation the fifth vital sign. I I really love that. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. It's something that Geraldine used to say to us all the time. So it's kind of this idea that that we kind of have cemented. And if you think about it, if um, I, I spoke about this a little bit, I, it's kind of a topic that kind of has scattered around in different episodes that I've done and different interviews that I've done. But but if you think about it, I was saying, I, I, interview, I did a, an interview with Will Sachs of Kindara. And I believe I said in that interview that in my perfect world, <laughs> doctors would be aware of this information and you could actually take your your chart to a doctor and that would be one of the considerations. That would be... A, a, a common question you know how's your menstruation how's and and gauging on your menstruation if it's falling outside of normal parameters that would actually serve as a tool for the doctor to help to diagnose any type of health concerns or hormonal imbalances obviously that's not how the world is today <laughs> mm. but it would be nice yeah I think that, that that's in my perfect world too Lisa <laughs> <laughs> well to switch gears a little bit um one of the I guess one of the uh, the ideas that was very present in your book, um, The Pill, Are You Sure It's For You? And it's also been, it's kind of like been a, a learning for me. So as I've done interviews with different professionals, as I've read different books, I recently did an interview with Holly Greg Spall, um, who wrote Sweetening the Pill. And uh, um, I did an interview with Dr. Laura Bryden, and we talked a lot about the pill. And I guess... For me, learning about this, the um, implicate or the the side effects of the pill, how far reaching they are, um, and especially how they can change your emotions and change your personality, I think that is probably one of the most alarming um, things that I've learned just having through my experience now of of having done these interviews and and really looking into this, and so. Uh, I guess we talked a lot about how important the menstrual cycle is and how, you know, it can be correlated with different um, emotions, you know, energy and creativity. And then when you're on the pill, your emotions and even kind of you, your personality, your outlook, your energy, your, um, your positivity can be changed in such a profound way. Um, and that's not really on the pill bottle to say that this might give you anxiety and depression and you know just go through all the different mood changes so maybe we could talk a little bit about um about that topic it's a very broad topic and in in your i would suggest for any of the listeners that have questions about the pill uh, to definitely check out the book it's available on amazon <clears throat> there's a kindle version um but in the book you really go through in in a lot of in excellent detail but just so many different side effects that the pill can have on your body yes it's uh, it is incredibly um incredibly broad there there are i mean i i i continue to find uh new pieces of research as i as they come my way or as i look into this um and any any one on their own, any one uh, result from a study on on its own may just look like you know a single thing. Sometimes they're more serious, sometimes they're less you know in inverted commas less serious. Uh, 
but it's the it's the sheer weight of the and the breadth of um of side effects that women experience women report uh that are found in studies uh that is is really overwhelming and i think one of the things that illustrates this is if we think about the nature of hormones hormones are incredibly powerful um uh, biochemical substances for instance uh, with uh, estradiol, there are there are about uh, either about or exactly I can't remember uh, twelve different estrogens that we produce, mm -hmm. and estradiol is the most common of those. Uh, if we were to collect uh, and distill the blood of a quarter of a million women, so that's two hundred and fifty thousand women of reproductive age at the peak of their cycle, so at the peak of estrogen production, and we were to distill their blood. <laughs> this is kind of a fanciful, it's not my ideal world, but it's a fanciful piece of research. If we were to distill their blood uh, and, and remove the estradiol, what we would find is we would have around about a teaspoon of estradiol. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. 250,000 women. <laughs> yeah. It just shows you, and yet as women, we are aware often of the um the the times where you know there's a whole lot of things that change in our body when we have uh peak estrogen compared to uh, less estrogen uh for instance around uh around ovulation uh it it changes our skin tone it changes uh the sparkle in our eyes it changes how we smell it changes how our uh the 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 relative swelling and moisture of our vulva it changes the viscosity of our blood um, and you know a whole list of other things, and this is from uh, that's relative to our our estrogen at other times in our cycle. So we, uh, whether we know it or not, we're observing by these things um, uh, the, the 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 fluctuations in estrogen. So if we think about that and how powerful estrogen must be in tiny quantities. So if we think of most uh, brands of pill that have um, estrogen as well as synthetic estrogen as well as synthetic progesterone. So, uh, and we're, at, we're we're multiplying that uh, estrogen by about four times our natural cycle. So, it has to have a powerful impact. Now, of course, the idea is that it's switching off our natural fertility, and it does do that. But to to think that it's doing that in isolation of all the other things that estrogen does and all the other things that hormones, whether they're natural or synthetic, do is completely fanciful. Um, of course, it's going to have an impact right throughout our bodies. Mm -hmm. And I think that... Um... I think that the pill, in a way, is kind of not regarded as a medication anymore. So it's a thing people take, but no one really considers it to be medication. And um, in the book, there was a statement uh, where you you included the pill formulations that I highlight it here. So ingredients of the pill, and I don't even think I can pronounce all of these, so I'm just going to preface this by saying that. Ingredients of the pill formulations include ethanol, estradiol, menstrual, lavol, lavor, gestural, nor, but you get the point. There's 10 different things here that I can't pronounce that are part of the pill formulation. But when we take the pill as women, we think, oh, it's just estrogen and progesterone. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, they're synthetic for a start. Uh, and I, I will say that we don't have all those formulations in, in each pill, but those are the, those are the things that um, go into, the, go into various, uh, various formulations of the pill. Um, and I will, I will say that uh, the, because of the, you know, the, 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 the pharmaceutical companies that produce the pill, um, of course, are businesses, they're companies, they're, they're multi-billion dollar businesses. So in order to retain um, the patent on the, on the contraceptive pills and the new formulations that come out, they don't aim to create synthetic uh, estrogen or progesterone that is exactly like natural they aim to tweak it a bit so that it's a bit different so that they can patent it mm. so it's not even you know uh, yes there are there may we may be told that there are strict guidelines and and health guidelines around uh, what drugs are released uh, i would question that 
but the you know it's not all about what's healthiest and most wonderful for us um it really we really have to be a little bit um a little bit cynical a little bit buyer beware about uh what is being presented to us and we know through uh there's sort of you know massive litigation going on i think in the united states at the moment around um Yasmin and Yaz and the problems that have come from were you know extreme problems that women have had using those brands of pill and at the time when those uh, were sort of first came out and for many years they were they were advertised really aggressively for all the fabulous benefits they would give you for you know kind of basically if you're a woman and you and you you want to be switched on and modern and feminine you know take this it'll help you out in all sorts of ways which uh to my way of thinking is extraordinarily um uh irresponsible and and really uh potentially is a is, is a is an abuse uh because it's not equally giving women and girls and the the parents of girls the informa- the full information about what the problems can be or even what problems to look out for there is a little bit of that in the packets in the pill that have been uh, that are legally required but it's very small relative to the the breadth and range of problems that uh, girls and women can have um, and and even the, those that do appear in the pill packets um, are are uh, very carefully worded in such a way that you would think, oh, well, yes, these problems are there, but who's to say whether that's caused by the pill or not? Um, or it's so rare, you know, that's that's often what comes up in these uh, in this as well, that it's very rare, so, oh, well, I'm not likely to get that. Whereas actually uh, many of the side effects, and particularly the emotional side effects, are not rare. They're incredibly common. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I feel like, I feel like, you know, I don't know if it's too much to say, but I feel like, you know, menstruation is part of a normal, healthy, natural bodily function. And given the effect that the cyclical hormones has on your moods and just on, you know, as someone who's been using natural fertility for a really long time, you know, about 12 years. So for about 12 years, I haven't been on the pill And so I'm kind of in tune with my body. I kind of get what's happening. And so my menstrual cycle, in a way, makes me who I am. So if you mess with your hormones, you kind of mess with who you are kind of at your core because it changes your moods and how you respond to things. And so this, when I was reading your book, uh, you have a story you have well there's throughout the book there's so many wonderful examples but there was one story that <laughs> really stood out for me and so I just want to read a little excerpt but basically you had a story of a woman named Carmela in your book and I thought that was a very powerful example of the impact that hormone conscious hormonal contraceptives can have so obviously every woman has a different ex- experience but this is Carmela's experience. So she had the implant. So in Canada, I think it's referred to as Norplant, but she had the implant inserted into her arm. And several months later, she had such severe mood swings and feelings of depression and suicidal ideation, just all this crazy stuff was going on for her. And so finally she ended up going to the doctor because she felt there was something wrong with her. So I just wanted to to read this quote because like I said, it really stood out for me. So in her words, she says, Fortunately, the doctor was really kind. He asked if I was taking any medication and simply nodded when I told him I had a contraceptive device in my arm. The implant was releasing measured doses of progesterone into my system like some contraceptive pills, but without the concern of forgetting to take the pill. We'll take that out and you'll be fine, was his response. We questioned the doctor repeatedly, wondering how he could be so sure that this was the problem. The doctor was sure and in his, certain, in his certainty very comforting. She goes on to say, I'll never forget the nurse's comment when I told her how long I'd had the implant. She very calmly remarked, oh, and you haven't killed anyone yet? What? She says, it's the progesterone. (laughs) So the reason it stood out is because she goes to the doctor for this issue and the doctors are already aware of it. So they don't even bat an eyelash. They must have encountered numerous women coming back requesting with this exact same problem they knew immediately what the problem was 
and it didn't even phase them because obviously it must have happened so many times, women coming back for this exact issue. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shocking story, isn't it? And it's not an uncommon story. Uh, and there's a, it's shocking on a whole lot of levels, but I'll, I'll mention a few things. One of the things is that uh, the, the doctor that she went to to have it out, uh, or she later made an appointment to have it out with him, um, wasn't the doctor that originally put it in. So she, uh, and she was fairly soon after giving birth to her second child that she had the implant put in and clearly wanting to have effective contraception at that time. The doctor who put it in didn't give her the uh, information that would have saved her months of agonising and thinking she was going completely nuts um, and, uh, and really, you know, which could have ended badly. Um, uh, she wasn't given that information. Now, I think that is a failure of duty of care mm -hmm. in, in, in no uncertain terms. Um, and the woman who told that story, you know, she said she, she uh, tried to forget it, uh, forget about it once it was all over. But it was, it was traumatic. It was a trauma for her. And uh, I think she could, have, uh, she could have been given more information. She may have made the same decision to have it put in. But once she started to observe those symptoms, she would have much more quickly realised, OK, it's not suiting me. I need, to, I need to deal with this. Rather than spending months, you know, questioning herself, nearly losing her marriage, um, you know, developing some bad habits uh, with her children, and so on and so forth. You know, these are these are difficult things. Uh, so uh, not that everybody is having that experience, but uh, I speak to a lot of women that have had, you know, a, ra a whole range of, of difficult experiences with the pill, sometimes only realising after, I, I say the pill in inverted commas because I'm, I'm including other forms of um, hormonal contraception, uh, sometimes even after having used it for 20 years and going off it, then realising that many of their health symptoms were actually clearing up after finishing the pill. So not even knowing that it was causing these problems. Uh, for some women who feel that they don't, they're not having any side effects from the pill. Um, and, you know, uh, I, uh, that can be great if they're, they're comfortable with that as a form of contraception. Um, I would also say to them that especially over time and using this form of contraception for over time, it does affect your nutritional uptake. So uh, you might start it at a time in your life when you, your nutritional stores are really in good shape, you're feeling really well, um, you may not have a reaction to the, the hormones in the contraception, but over time it upsets your uh, nutritional balance and it upsets your capacity to absorb nutrients. So you might find over the years uh, because of that, um, and basically, um, uh, you know, varying forms of malnutrition, is that because of that, uh, certain uh, genetic disposition to types of ill health will start to appear, and it won't be tied back to um, this, this imbalance that's being caused by the pill. So there are a lot of women experiencing side effects that they're not conscious that are, that are part of the pill. And, um, you know, I, I, fundamentally, I think the problem is women and girls aren't uh, being given the respect of informed choice, being able to make an informed choice about using the pill as a contraception or even, which is much more, you know, more and more common these days, using it, in, I put in inverted commas, therapeutically for any menstrual problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, the the section of your book where you detail the different nutritional deficiencies that can be caused as a result of being on the pill. And also you go through in such detail about how it can affect different areas. So having deficiencies of certain nutrients can impact your likelihood of suffering from depression or suffering from different uh, different types of conditions that you wouldn't necessarily in attribute to the pill. And also the impact that being deficient in zinc and in B vitamins and in certain uh, nutrients has, um, especially when women are getting off the pill and trying to get pregnant right away. And so that's something that I've talked about a lot on the podcast. But these are things that are not on that insert. <laughs> these are things that are not emphasized. 
I really, until I kind of, like I said, until I started doing these interviews and until I've, you know, read different work. So now your book and reading Sweetening the Pill and talking with health professionals and really looking into any, and even just speaking with women who I've interviewed on the podcast, who just describe their experience of being on the pill and then coming off the pill. Um, I don't really think that depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation is listed on the pamphlet in a really emphasized way. So uh, it's important to continue raising awareness so that women are are made aware of the, these side effects that are very common but not discussed. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, do, it does need a lot more awareness. Um, and I think, you know, the, 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 a couple of the different things we've talked about today really play in together. The fact that uh, the menstrual cycle is very commonly seen as a as a nothing, as a not important, except for the few times you might want to conceive in your life. Uh, that plays into our willingness to wipe it away. Even women who are on a a, a twenty eight day pill and have a bleed, um, many don't realise that it's not a true bleed. It's just a withdrawal bleed. So you're having that withdrawal period of um, seven days of um, placebo pills. So you know there's a there's a bleed because of that so that's not that's nothing to do with a true ovulation or a true period um, and and I think we need to question really anything that's interfering with our nat natural function and sometimes our natural function is maybe an experience of pain or ill health we need to then look at what we can do to truly get a, a have a hormonal balance and to reach a healthy state with our cycle rather than uh, what I would call knocking out the warning light Mm -hmm. uh, and assuming that we can just wipe away a whole natural part of our uh, function uh, without any uh, without any reaction or side effect to that, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And so I'm aware that we're kind of um, edging towards the end of the interview today, and I just have a few final questions to end the show. Um, but one of the questions I wanted to one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, um, so in the book, when you talked about the effectiveness rates of the pill and uh, different effectiveness rates of, of different, you know, non-hormonal methods, I thought it was interesting that, you know, you talked about how the motivation and intention of the user, the consistency, and also how much you believe and are confident in the method has to do with it. So it's, it's obviously not just the method, but when you're kind of working with women who might be afraid of transitioning off of hormonal contraceptives uh, in favor of horm non-hormonal natural methods of, of contraception, um, I guess, how do you counsel those women uh, in terms of effectiveness and how do you help to increase their confidence in natural methods? Mm -hmm. Great. It's a really great question, Lisa. And we do have a pervading, a very, very powerful belief that the, the pill is uh, the very best form of contraception. Uh, to me, it's a little bit, you know, do, do you remember the Jetsons? The, um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, it's a little bit this sort of uh, incredibly optimistic belief in technology mm -hmm. and that this was such a fabulous, and, and this, the pill is still talked about in these terms of what an incredible invention, what an incredible liberator of women. And, and in some ways it has been, and in other ways it's more the, the idea of it that has been liberating the idea of the perfect pill and the perfect control of uh, fertility. The truth of it is is nothing like that. Um, and in fact, women uh, are, during the 60s were, uh, were advocating for and getting far more access to all kinds of contraception, not just hormonal contraception. So there's many reasons why it, it wasn't on its own the, um, the liberator that we, that we like to think of it as in, in our society. So, um, yeah, the the uh, the pill uh, does have such sort of far-reaching, so such far-reaching effects. So, as far as effectiveness goes, yeah, it's um, you know, we tend to believe we often we often hear you know ninety-nine percent. Okay, ninety-nine percent sounds 
it's very close to 100. It's very good. So we tend to take this on as a, as a belief. Uh, the, the true uh, user effectiveness rates are more like 92 to 94%. And that's per year. So of 100 women using the pill over a period of a year, six to eight uh, will get pregnant anyway. So in a 10-year period, that's uh, of 100 women, that's 60 to 80 pregnancy. So when some of them might be the same women, some of them might be different women, but that's, uh, you know, th there's, there is a risk. So um, What's important for some women, I mean, I don't, uh, what I think is really important, as I said, is informed choice so that we're able to make a full, a fully informed choice and know what the risks are so that we can continue to make that choice. We're fertile for heterosexual women. You know, we're, we're fertile and wanting contraception for many, many years of our lives. I would like to see us have more rounded education about contraception, uh, including uh, fertility awareness, so that we can make different choices at different times according to where we are in our relationships, where we are in our life, where we are in our health needs, and we're able to have a much more holistic picture of what's going to work for us. And uh, I think that uh, the effectiveness rates will match that. So if we have an understanding of our bodies, we have an understanding of a variety of contraceptive methods, and we choose according to what's best for us, uh, and we choose with the support and awareness um, and the participation of partners, we will then make the best choices, not only for ourselves health-wise, but also for effectiveness rates. And we will use those methods in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a good point because oftentimes you hear things like, oh, well, the diaphragm is only this percent effective. If someone's using the diaphragm and they absolutely love the diaphragm and they find that it's the best solution for them for birth control and they use that diaphragm you know perfectly which is not hard to use a method perfectly but they use it perfectly and perhaps they use it with a um, you know a health friendly spermicide that doesn't cause them issues and and all those types of things but but I guess you see I loved that that point in your book that if you actually the effectiveness isn't necessarily what it says on the box the user has a significant role in the effectiveness of whatever type of contraceptive method that you choose. Mm, absolutely. Sometimes we've put, uh, you know, the studies, uh, scientific studies, effectiveness rates ahead of all other considerations. And of course, you know, we are, you know, if, if we're at a time in our life where we really don't want to conceive, of course, that's a very powerful consideration. Um, and, there, you know, it needs to be more nuanced in order even to have the most effective, uh, the, the highest effectiveness. Uh, it needs to be far more nuanced as according to who we are and where we are at in our lives and where we're at in our relationships as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I just have a few more questions that I tend to ask um, just to kind of wrap up the interview. And one of them is, what is the most common myth about fertility that you would like to see corrected? Oh wow! <laughs> my, I, I'm sort of racing through racing through ideas in my mind. I, I guess I'm going to answer this in a in a in a poetic way, and I don't know whether it's a myth or not. But um, I, you know, I because I run programs for girls and for uh, for young girls, for teenage girls, for women, uh, and for couples. I have done a lot of contemplating about fertility over the years, and I think we demonise fertility. We have a lot of fear around fertility, mostly fear of getting pregnant, and then for certain times, fear of not getting pregnant. Um, and I think we need to embrace fertility in its wholeness uh, far more uh, and understand it and work with it in a similar way to perhaps an organic farmer might work with nature, work with the seasons, work with cycles, work with plants, work with an understanding of weeds and pests uh, and embrace them and understand them so that uh, that farmer can can uh, you know produce the crops and, and work uh, in a positive way with nature rather than have fear and anxiety and hold it at bay. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be an amazing approach to fertility and it would have a profound impact on women throughout the world. Um, so the second question is, uh, what is the most common myth about the fertility awareness method or natural fertility management methods that you would like to see corrected? 
Well, well that, that answer comes very quickly. <laughs> the common myth is that uh, it doesn't work. And uh, I find a lot of surprising, a lot of people and a surprising number of doctors will lump all uh, natural methods in together. So lump in um, a, a poorly used rhythm method, which has a very low effectiveness rate, with the best uh, taught and the best used fertility awareness method, um, the modern modern methods and well taught, which is has a very high effectiveness rate, 99% plus. So when all these are lumped in together um, and women who are asking uh, of their doctor uh, or other health practitioner uh, to, you know, I really want to learn natural methods and are having that, that wish dismissed uh, is incredible ignorance and, and um, is really sad because women wanting that are really wanting to experience and understand their bodies and, and these methods can be so effective if they're taught well and understood well. So I would like to see, um, you know, you know the, these methods much more widely available, uh, much more widely respected by those who influence women's choices uh, and perhaps it would be great to have, you know, an, an, an immense um, injection of funds to, to help us all do that. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Okay, well, last question of the day. Um, for a woman who's currently on the pill, but she knows she wants to, she doesn't want to have a baby right now, but she knows she wants to have a baby in the next few years, maybe the next two or three uh, years. What advice, if any, would you give to her? Uh, well, that, that's probably not a simple short answer, but um, I would certainly suggest she reads The Pill Are You Sure It's For You? Mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of answers to her questions she would find in there about the pill, but also about preparing for conception. Um, I understand there are a lot of women in that situation where they're not wanting to conceive just yet, but they're wanting to start thinking about to going toward a conception. I would recommend she really looks very seriously at, uh, she and her partner look very seriously at natural methods, methods that are not introducing synthetic chemicals into her body because it will take some time to re-establish a, a really good uh, level of nutrition. Um, and the, the, uh, the better she, she is nutritionally at the time of conception, uh, the, the greater the chance she has of conception and the healthier that conception, pregnancy, birth and baby will be for her. So it's really important to start considering now um, going off the pill, off using uh, hormonal contraception and looking at what other methods uh, might work for her. I would say ideally uh, fertility awareness methods because not only are you able to use those for contraception, but they will help her really be aware of where she's at in her fertility cycle so that she and her partner can time conception um, and achieve a, con a really healthy conception at such a time as they want to. It's far more likely if you're aware of when you are actually fertile. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, Jane, you know, I, I really appreciate you being here today. How can our listeners get in touch with you and find out more about the work that you do and the programs that you run? Probably the best way, I have a website, uh, www dot jane bennett that's bennett with two n's and two t's all lowercase and all running together jane bennett dot com dot au uh, and you can you can email me from that site uh it has you know a, a whole lot of different aspects of what i do and uh, we can take it from there okay great and make sure for all the listeners to check out the show notes so in the show notes i'll link to jane's website as well as the website for celebration day for girls and also, of course, we'll link to the books, uh, both books. We've been talking about The Pill, Are You Sure It's For You? So I'll be linking that in the show notes as well. And so, Jane, I just want to thank you so much for spending some time with me today and talking about all of these fantastic topics. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, you just bring so much insight and wisdom. And I, I, I said it at the beginning, and I'll say it again. I really loved your book. And it's just such a wealth of information <laughs> in my perfect world. I think it would be part of the high school curriculum and junior high school curriculum. So it would be read not just by women, but men and everybody, because there's just such a wealth of information there. So I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lisa. It's been my absolute pleasure to speak with you too. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please make sure to share it with a friend. 
If you haven't yet subscribed to the Fertility Friday podcast, just make sure to search for Fertility Friday on iTunes or Stitcher and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Of course, there's always amazing guests coming up and you definitely won't want to miss uh, who I'll be interviewing next. And of course, if you're loving the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes so that more people can find it. And as for me, you can find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. You can stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes for today's episode, which you'll find at fertilityfriday.com slash Jane. And you can also find me on the Fertility Facebook fan page, which is facebook.com slash Fertility Fridays with an S. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.